All right. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to give it just one or two more minutes uh, so that we can let boarding continue uh, before we start this, this session. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and give it a start. Um, hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, my name is Tyson Barker, and I am the Deputy Di Executive Director here at the Aspen Institute Germany in Berlin. Um, I am delighted to, uh, to welcome you all to this uh, book presentation uh, in our digital uh, program that we are doing today. Um, I will let uh, Tobias Jacewski introduce the book and introduce the topic a little bit. Uh, but let me just say a couple of words about why this is so important to me. Um, many of you know that Aspen Germany has been working on disinformation specifically around uh, influencers and uh, disinformation in the German speaking uh, world. Um, and we're continuing with this work, but what we want to do is also plug into what the world is doing on this, what is the best scholarship on the topic of dis disinformation, and specifically how the disinformation landscape is evolving, because we know that this is not a static landscape, that this continues to change. And I think if we've learned one thing in the uh, COVID era, is that disinformation, like everything else, has been accelerated. Um, and uh, the use of tech in, in propagating, in disseminating this information has also increased. Uh, but we want to we wanna dive into these topics, obviously, and I want to give the floor to my colleague, Tobias Jacewski, who is a program officer in the digital program at Aspen Germany to introduce the speakers and the topic. So thanks for joining us, and, welcome, and we're going to have a great discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tyson. And also good afternoon, uh, everybody from, from my side, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so my name is Tobias Osewski. As Tyson said, I'm a program officer with Aspen Germany's digital program. And um, I'm really delighted to have you all here with us uh, today um, for, our, uh, for this talk on the recently published um, book entitled, How to Lose the Information War, Russia, Fake News, um, and the Future of Conflict. I'm joined by two brilliant speakers, Nina Jankowicz, the author herself, and Irene Plank from the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. But before I introduce um, the speakers um, and we jump into the fun, I just want to uh, point out some housekeeping rules, um, even if I'm sure that all of us are Zoom experts by now. So this discussion is on the record, it's being recorded, and we will post this later to our YouTube channel. We're going to have a conversation between the three of us for about the, th the first 30 minutes, and uh, then um, we are going to open it up for Q&A from the audience. And there are three, three ways to, uh, that you can ask a question. You can uh, write a question in the Q&A box in the bottom. But our preferred method is uh, for you to ask your question yourself. So you can do that by raising your hand with the raise hand icon, and I will call on you. Uh, please identify yourself, name and affiliation, um, and who you would like to address your question to. Um, and last but not least, if you're calling in, you can hit star nine to raise your virtual hand. So and that's it for the housekeeping rules. And um, now let's get started with introducing our speakers. So Nina Jankowicz is a disinformation fellow at the Wilson Center, where she studies the intersection of democracy and technology in Central and Eastern Europe. She um, is as I already mentioned, the author of uh, this amazing book. Um, and she's also advised the Ukrainian government on strategic communications uh, under the auspices of Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship. She is also a prolific writer and has been in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic and others. She's a frequent television um, and radio commentator on disinformation and Russian and Eastern European affairs. And prior to her Fulbright grant in Ukraine, Nina managed democracy assistance programs to Russia and Belarus at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. So welcome, Nina. Um, Irene Plank is the Director for Strategic Communication at the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin since July 2020. Um, prior to that, she worked as the Head of Division Business and Human Rights, um, where she coordinated the implementation of the German National Action Plan Business and Human Rights across the government and connected the German efforts in this field with the international agenda. 
Um, before that, she has mainly worked in security related areas and was uh, deputy director of cabinet of the NATO secretary general in Brussels between uh, 2012 and 2016. Prior to that, she was deputy head of mission at the German embassy in Beirut um, and her, uh, some other posts were Kinshasa, Kabul and Seattle. And she has also been deputy head of the Federal Foreign Offices Division for Humanitarian Health between 2016 and 2017. So we're pleased that uh, you both, Nina and Irena, are uh, here with us today. And um, I'm directly jumping into uh, the first discussion or the first big question I'm, I'm asking to Nina. Um, I had the pleasure to read your book uh, in the last weeks and it was not only a crash course in um, Russian state-sponsored disinformation campaigns, but uh, you're also delivering um, profound insights into the social, political and cultural environment uh, of the five selected countries. So um, my first question or my first questions would be, what do these, these five cases, case studies, uh, Estonia, Georgia, Poland, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, tell us about modern democracies, information ecosystems, and how do they differ from the US, the Western European and the German narratives? So the floor is yours, Nina. Great. Thank you so much, Tobias. It's great to be with you guys today. I wish it were in person, but as it is, it's pretty great uh, to, to have the opportunity to speak to so many audiences um, about the book. And thank you so much for your kind words about it. Um, and I guess the first thing I want to say is that my view on all of these topics very much comes not only from the regional perspective, I'm, I'm a Russia and Eastern Europe specialist, but also uh, from a practitioner perspective as somebody who thinks very deeply about democracy and very much wants uh, you know, our democracies to be protected. And I, I do believe that disinformation knows no political party. Ultimately, the victim is uh, the democratic Order, the functioning of our, our, of our democratic institutions. Um, so when we look at the case studies in the book, there's a couple of things that unite us, certainly, um, unite the case studies in Europe with the West and the way that we've handled this problem. And I think in general, um, probably is evident from the book, How to Lose the Information War, the title, uh, that you know, we're all a little bit still on the back foot, even with four years of clear hindsight about how Russian disinformation works. Um, but one of the uniting factors about the book is that you know, whether you're Estonia or Ukraine or Poland, uh, three nations that definitely have a clear understanding of what states like Russia use disinformation for, understand the Russian threat, as it were, you cannot fight disinformation when you are embracing the same tactics yourself. Um, on a, you know, both on a strategic level or on a political party level, if you're not cracking down on the domestic disinformation uh, that we're seeing proliferating, and I think that Aspen Germany has been working very much to counter. Um, these are the things that are really, really important. You can't have a two-level policy and say, disinformation is bad when it comes from outside of our borders, but when, when it's inside of our borders, we're going to turn a blind eye to that. And that's certainly something that we've seen in the United States, something that we're really struggling with here ahead of the election. Um, and there's two case studies in the book, I think, that really draw that out very nicely, and that's Poland and the Republic of Georgia, both of which, again, have, have no uh, misunderstandings about the threat that Russia poses to them, their sovereignty, uh, their information space. And it's very clearly spelled out in their national security doctrines that this is the case, right? Uh, they, they have entire units in their uh, foreign ministries dedicated to countering disinformation, same for ministries of defense. And yet the two ruling parties in these cases either are allowing Russian influence to creep in through other means. So in Georgia, that would be uh, cultural and media, um, sometimes business ties. And in Poland, uh, the use of disinformation by the Law and Justice Party, which is fairly well documented in academic studies and beyond, um, essentially undermines the very good policy that the, the government has otherwise toward countering Russian specifically disinformation. Um, and I think this is very similar to what we're seeing here in the United States. Now, I am not an expert on Germany, but from what little I do know about the German regulatory environment, certainly um, there are, I think, cultural idiosyncrasies in the German environment that allow uh, the 
Bundestag to take more action um, than we would see here in the United States. Um, because of the First Amendment, there is just a real reticence to regulate speech at all. And as a result, what we have here in the US ahead of the election, uh, which is now, I think, 43 days away, or is it 45? at any rate, less than 50, fewer than 50 days. Um, what we have is a, a, a really unequal environment um, where, you know, we're, we're very much pushing back against Russian disinformation, Chinese, Iranian, and the intelligence community is talking about that. And yet this, the sort of regulatory mechanisms that would allow us just to have control over the online advertising space, the same way that we have control over, for instance, print, TV, and radio, uh, political advertisements. We don't even have regulation in that sphere because we are so reticent to uh, put any regulation or rules around uh, freedom of speech here in the United States. And that is something that we are going to con continue to struggle with and has to be uh, a question that we answer for, for ourselves or else we're leaving our, a real vulnerability. Um, and this is, I think, something that's really uh, democracies often bristle when, when, I, uh, when I approach this kind of misconception about disinformation. Um, dis disinformation doesn't work when there isn't a societal vulnerability to be exploited. In many cases, Russia uses ethnic fissures, economic fissures. Uh, in the United States, racism is a big part of what Russia does. And um, without healing these internal fissures, we can't hope to have any effect pushing back, um, whether that's in a narrative function uh, or if we're just, you know, slapping sanctions on bad actors. Um, we need to look inward and, and heal those fissures and the societies that are most resilient to disinformation, both the, those that I outline in the book, as well as countries like Sweden and Finland, which are quite resilient and have, you know, strong media literacy programs, things like that. They recognize that healing those fissures is integral to um, having a healthy information space that is, uh, you know, um, quite resilient, that protects their democracies, that protects uh, people's equal access to information and equal ability to express themselves, which right now, the way things stand, that isn't the case. Um, so I think I'll stop there. And, uh, and I look forward especially to, to hearing what you all have to say about the, the German regulatory environment. <laughs> Thank you Nina, for your input. I think that that's a, first, uh, a great first um, um, idea uh, of, of what you're, you've been dealing with in your book. Um, so I will ask the second question to Irena. Um, first of all, what do you think about the, the points Nina raised? And then of course, um, which of the issues um, Nina mentioned were present in the ministry's reasoning in uh, consolidating its work around countering disinformation in 2016? And how would you describe um, your, uh, yeah, the Foreign Office's current approach on countering disinformation? Mm, all right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for that question. And Nina, thank you for this, uh, for this extremely interesting book. Uh, because I think, uh, uh, especially from a European perspective, uh, it offers quite a number uh, of valuable insights into tactics and mechanisms of disinformation campaigns, in this case, Russian disinformation campaigns. Um, we, um, of course, we, we look at a lot of players. And one thing you said, I want to, uh, that really struck a chord. Um, you said treatment of disinformation, whether it uh, occurs inside your own borders or outside of them, uh, to treat that differently. Um, we, we, we've come to the opinion that uh, that doesn't work. Uh, already social media don't work that way. And disinformation doesn't work that way. Um, so the lines become blurred. And of course, being a national agent that poses a number of challenges, how do you work with other states, how do you work on that uh, within the framework of the European Union? Uh, and who does it? Is it the foreign offices? Is it regulatory instances, national regulatory instances? So that's all questions where we don't yet have all the answers. And something else that I found very, very interesting, you highlighted the freedom of speech uh, element. Uh, that defines discussion or that defines um, 
ways of reaction in the United States. Um, I think what makes the, I'm just going to talk about the German uh, environment here now, uh, but I think it's pretty similar in, in most Europe, other European countries, uh, is yes, of course, we, we have the freedom of speech thing too, um, uh, as a very, very high ranking fundamental right. Um, but uh, we, I think the consciousness of uh, data privacy protection uh, is also a very high ranking uh, element in, in the political discussion around all of this and gives you quite different forms of leverage uh, if you want to, to address uh, disinformation questions. So I think maybe we can, uh, we can uh, discuss this at a, at a later point. Um, so thank you very much for your book. Very, very interesting uh, uh, insights that are very useful for, for our work too. So um, coming to your second question, what, what do we do <laughs> here in Germany and in the European Union? Uh, I think uh, that started some five, six years ago uh, that European member states uh, um, um, realized that we had to tackle this question uh, in, an, in an organized and institutional way. And I think one of the main points is that both the EU and its member states uh, need to enlarge their capacities to analyze uh, uh, disinformation, to, to spot it, to analyze it, uh, and to augment their capacities for, um, for resilience, um, to communicate in a more attractive fashion, both within the EU and to the outside. Um, and the other important thing is that the digital information sphere um, needs to have some measure of regulation that both helps to protect uh, people's data privacy uh, and helps to regulate what companies, uh, digital companies can do and can not do. Um, we also think, and there's maybe a point of discussion, um, that I think what in the book's called debunking, um, that's a difficult subject. Um, we're not quite sure that debunking myths or debunking disinformation is always the right approach. Um, we are, of course, intensifying uh, and uh, enlarging our capacities for social media monitoring to see what's happening. Uh, but I think our instrument of preference is our own fact-based narrative, developing our own narrative, our own fact-based narrative, and finding ways of communicating this really well. We are also intensifying both on a national and on a European level, uh, our exchange with civil society and with fact checkers. Uh, and um, we do think uh, that we, we uh, have to delve into the question, how do we make people, especially already very young people, um, media conscious, media wise, uh, in, in order to build uh, a general resistance against uh, disinformation. Um, this is going to be part of our discussions within the framework of our uh, EU Council Presidency, which is going on right now until the end of the year. Uh, we do work closely uh, uh, in the G7 framework, something that's called the Rapid Res Response Mechanism, and of course with NATO. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here, if that's okay. 
uh, I hope I haven't quite forgotten one of your questions. If so, we'll get to that. Not at all. We have enough time to answer some more questions. I think that was a great overview and, and you raised, both of you raised a lot of uh, interesting aspects. So um, free speech, um, uh, you also mentioned the evolution, a bit of disinformation um, in recent times. Um, and also, uh, I, I, I think I heard the aspect of, um, of, uh, of education, um, yeah. uh, what, what kind of uh, aspect uh, or role this education should play um, in such strategies against disinformation. So um, I would like to, um, to start with uh, probably the basic um, question on, uh, or let's say a broader question on the, um, uh, on the uh, 2020 disinformation topography. Um, what, um, because we all have seen that the, um, the, an explosion of disinformation and conspiracy theories, um, as you already mentioned before, and uh, often also state supported. So um, how would you um, assess this uh, evolving threat in, in, this, uh, in, in this time? And um, what kind of a degree of international cooperation um, on this front is already existing and uh, is it sufficient, not only in, on the European, but also on the, of course, transatlantic level. Um, well, you, you, you can start, Nina. Great, thank you. Um, so I think what is different about 2020 is that we're seeing malign actors really adapting their tactics to the increased awareness and also uh, both on the general public side, but also increased action that the platforms are taking. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that the platforms are doing nearly enough, but what they are doing um, is, is cracking down on the very obvious kind of fake bot and troll automated accounts, um, a lot of which we were seeing in 2016. And I think there's a broad misconception, at least here in the United States, that that's still kind of the main vector through which disinformation flows. And that could not be farther from the truth. We're seeing a lot less uh, of those accounts on things like Twitter. Uh, Facebook is saying that they're taking down a million accounts a day. Um, obviously, we can't fully take them at their word when they say something like that. But still, there are a lot of those accounts being taken down, action being taken against them. And so as a result, rather than um, investing in that sort of infrastructure, again, that inorgan in inorganic amplification infrastructure, what we're seeing bad actors, and again, this is both on the domestic and foreign level, do instead is um, investing in information laundering. And this might look very different depending on what the actor or who the actor is. Um, but essentially the idea is to obscure the initial uh, you know, starting point of that narrative, whether it's coming from a bad foreign actor or you know, a domestic disinformer. Um, and that can be done through a variety of mechanisms. You can create a, a website that looks like a news organization. We've seen Russia doing this in a couple of cases. Um, in the most recent takedown from Peace Data, which you may have heard about, which was an IRA, Internet Research Agency, linked uh, operation, they were actually hiring American freelance journalists to write articles for them. And then rather than purchasing ads, they did purchase a few ads. Um, but again, this is an area with more scrutiny now. So it's not necessarily about ads. Um, they were dropping those links into Facebook groups. Uh, where they were then proliferating. So you could see uh, links in pro-Julian Assange groups. You could see them in social democratic groups. Uh, they were targeting the left with this website. And that is really great uh, for a bad actor to do because a group, um, usually segmented by vulnerability, by interest, uh, and we know that these, the Facebook algorithms actually kind of indoctrinate and um, push people toward extreme views in these groups. Uh, basically, all the person has to do is drop that link in the group and then it will proliferate. Um, so groups are a big vulnerability, but again, this sort of information laundering is something that's really uh, become the method of choice. It puts some plausible deniability between uh, the bad actor and the ultimate audience, as well as the investigators who are looking at it. It's much more difficult to uh, to find the origin of, you know, a, a post going viral when it's been uh, spread and amplified throughout these groups by authentic voices. So I think that's a key difference um, from, from 2016 to now. Um, looking at the question of, of international cooperation, 
I think there are a couple of structures that have certainly gotten more international support over the past uh, four years. It was a lot less coordinated from my view when I was working in Ukraine. And uh, actually, this is one of the ways that I got into this whole area of, um, of interest. I was working in the Ukrainian foreign ministry, uh, advising the spokesperson on strategic communications. And it just seemed like there were a plethora of foreign advisors, a bunch of different programs doing fact checking, some of which were with the same partners, some weren't, some were ultimately very contradictory. Um, and so I think there has been a lot more coordination in that regard. However, um, it, the regulatory environment, I think, is, is where we, we fall down in the transatlantic community because we now have this patchwork of regulations and the United States is obviously lagging behind, abdicating its role uh, as the home for most of these companies um, without a united or at least um, more coordinated regulatory front, uh, we, we introduce a lot of loopholes into the system that bad actors can exploit. Um, so I would love to see more coordination among Western democracies about what the online information environment should look like and how to hold co uh, companies like Facebook, these enormous companies to account. Because as it stands, we know that um, the large tech companies will listen to perhaps Germany and the United States and some of the other big players. But if you're a non-Western, uh, especially non-English speaking country, like for instance, Ukraine, which is Facebook's third fastest growing market, um, it becomes a lot more difficult to get traction when you are having a domestic uh, issue with disinformation in, in your country. We know that's gone very poorly in places like Burma, for instance. And that's, those are two quite large countries. Imagine you know, what, what the smaller countries have to deal with. So I think that's incumbent on the democracies to, uh, to really um, rally around. And then the last thing I'll say, and I think this is probably very obvious to everyone on the call, um, but unfortunately there is a lack of political will here in Washington to address this issue, both on the regulatory level in Congress, but also um, from the, the White House itself, the administration itself. Um, this issue should be something that uh, any administration is creating an, an interagency process on. Um, and instead, what we've seen is a kind of patchwork response in the US federal government, which means that our international response and the coordinating role that uh, we might have played otherwise, or certainly supporting initiatives like this, I think we, we are weak in, in that way. And I hope to see that change uh, in the you know, next, um, after the next election. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Irina, from a German and European perspective, would you have um, a similar um, analysis of, of, of these um, aspects? Well, actually, regulatory environment, uh, by its very nature, uh, is fragmented. We don't have a world regulatory uh, uh, framework for this. Uh, so, but maybe it's interesting in that context uh, to to talk a little bit uh, about the EU action plan against disinformation, because that's at least uh, the EU member states who are coordinating and trying to, to, to build up structures uh, against disinformation in an environment that's, I mean, it's incredibly um, fast changing. The whole media environment is changing at a very, very fast pace. Uh, and that makes it quite difficult uh, for, for states and, and for, for the EU to keep up, nevertheless. So this, <clears throat> this action plan against disinformation at least uh, already delineates four core areas where the EU is building up structures and stepping up its efforts. Uh, and one uh, is quite simply a uh, better detection of disinformation. Uh, second, to coordinate EU member states' reaction to disinformation. And there we have uh, um, uh, put in place a so-called rapid alert system, which during the, well, all since the COVID pandemic has begun, has been a major platform of exchange between member states on COVID-19 disinformation uh, and related issues. So that's that. Uh, third pillar would be an intensified uh, cooperation with platforms uh, and the whole digital industry. Um, right now, that's at the stage of uh, 
of well a behavior a, a codified behavior uh, um, level uh, and uh, last but not least that's something we've already talked about is strengthening resilience of the eu member states citizens and an important part to us uh, right now of this building up resilience is the is a European network uh, of independent fact checkers. So that's what's going on on the EU level in an extremely rapidly changing environment. Doesn't make it easy. Definitely, thank you so much, Rihanna. That's that's uh, interesting, and that's also a good uh, moment to um, to pull up our uh, poll. We have a poll for our participants, and um, after this poll, we're going to open the Q and A. Uh, session. Um, so I'm starting the poll and reading it for our for those who are at the phone. Um, so the question is, which of the following do you see as the most dangerous super spreader of disinformation in 2020? Fake news websites? A. B would be closed message systems like Telegram. C. Closed Facebook groups. D. State-backed news agencies like RT and Xinhua. E, a state backed troll and bot farms. Um, F, social media influencers. G, user generated message boards like ACOM. Um, H, broadcast television. I, print media. And last but not least, postal mail. So I'll give you another minute to, to respond. And I mean, our panelists can't respond, but um, you kind of already answered this. But if you want, um, to um, probably, um, uh, yeah, have a have a deeper look at this uh, at this poll, and and probably you you also have um, you would say that there are some points missing. What do you say, Nina? Well, I think it's very hard to uh, choose something that is most dangerous. Although I am curious to see what our um, our attendees say. Um, I think really this is an ecosystem, right? And it all. Uh, feeds off um, itself and, and one another. Um, and there are some vectors that are more, uh, more influential um, that have a greater impact. I think influencers are something that we've really not talked about very much yet. Um, but just as a personal anecdote, uh, recently after the Black Lives Matter movement really um, regained and was reinvigorated here in the United States after the murder of George Floyd in, in, uh, in June, a couple of my friends who had become active in the movement started sharing some posts from Black Lives Matter influencers. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, you may have seen uh, some rallies related to child trafficking um, that were actually organized by QAnon uh, supporters. And I guess somehow these influencers had gotten sucked into this counter trial trafficking QAnon um, rally and they were sharing a bunch of my friends were sharing these influencers posts uh, about counter trial trafficking and I had to explain to them actually these rallies this weekend were organized by QAnon. Here's some information about QAnon because that's this this kind of creeping um, indoctrination is is actually what happens a lot of the time and it also speaks to the power of influencers to counter disinformation um which you know we've not uh not seen too many efforts to do we early after 2016 i remember a couple of hollywood led efforts specifically about russia that came off frankly as very partisan um which i think is really important when we're pushing back against disinformation it really needs to be from a very apolitical lens um but in a couple of the countries that i profile in my book they look at influencers as a as a vector of of delivering you know trusted information about uh, about how to counter fake news, quote unquote. And one of them, one of the um, efforts that's really interesting is in Georgia, uh, they, there's a small group that has been training um, artists, uh, both you know, actors, uh, comedians, musicians, about disinformation. And these are usually people from outside of the capital, Tbilisi. So they send them back to their regions. They do a show there. They do their normal thing. But they also are sneaking in some some tidbits uh, and material about countering disinformation and the threat of foreign influence, which I think is very interesting and should be explored more uh, in the West. Definitely. And I mean, in Germany, we also had um, uh, have a special year regarding and special month now um, with all this uh, QAnon disinformation um, 
um, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, the Quiet Incan movement. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this is also a thing um, you are uh, uh, having to, um, to deal with at the moment, Irena. Yes, uh, but the the interesting thing actually uh, uh, about the uh, uh, disinformation regarding COVID and the QAnon thingy uh, that a lot of that uh, is uh, propagated domestically. So that's not so much uh, uh, only a, a, a wee part of that comes from non-German sources. Um, so that's. A little bit of a different animal, but uh, of course that uh, we've also noticed uh, that this happens and happened in a, and still is happening in a lot of European member states. So we're using that rapid alert mechanism for early detection and for a common strategy, a communication strategy against that. Uh, but uh, as I said, it's always changing, always something new. So uh, it's keeping us on our toes. We're having a look at uh, the results of our poll. And our almost 50 participants see um, the most uh, dangerous super spreader of disinformation 2020 in state backed troll and bot farms. So, kind of um, the, the classic um, uh, issue. Um, as uh -huh. Second, I think then we have three in the second row. It's um, the closed message, message systems like Telegram, closed face, Facebook groups, and social media influencers. Um, and, uh, and then also the state-backed news agencies like RT and Xinhua. And, um, and uh, 3% for the face new, uh, fake news uh, websites. Um, yeah, that's, that seems to be pretty interesting. Um, also regarding what you said, uh, Nina, um, uh, that, that the ecosystem has changed a lot since 2016, but we have still um, the impression that um, that state-backed, um, you know, the, the state-backed environment, troll and platforms are, are the most impo important aspect uh, in this area. Um, so let's open up um, for the Q&A session. We have several uh, written questions and um, we also have a raised hand and, and I'll start with the uh, the raised hand, as I said, um, so Klaus uh, Wittmann, you're up. I think you have to unmute your... Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? yeah, I'm Klaus Wittmann, Senior Fellow at the Aspen Institute. <clears throat> and I would like to ask the author of this interesting book, has the readiness of people to swallow disinformation also to do with the development in our societies where opinion becomes more important than, than facts. And uh, do you deal with this phenomenon in your book? And to uh, Irene Plank from the Foreign Office, I would like to ask a practical question. To what extent does your office cooperate with the NATO Strategic Center on uh, uh, the NATO Center on Strategic Co uh, Co um, Communication at Riga. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you, Klaus. A really interesting question. So I, I deal with this a little bit. Um, there are definitely other books that go very deeply into the psychology of disinformation, and that is not my specialty. But what I will tell you is that um, there are a couple things that I think contribute to uh, people's readiness to consume disinformation. Um, the first to some extent is the deterioration, deterioration, at least here in the United States, of our local news environment. Um, with an, I actually, uh, two years ago, did um, a great program sponsored by the U.S. Embassy in America House in Heidelberg and went to five German cities and was, uh, I was amazed that everywhere I went, um, just the, the, there was a table in every hotel filled with local newspapers. I love that. We, we don't have that to the same extent here in the United States anymore, unfortunately. And where that local news has uh, been obliterated, um, what fills the vacuum is often uh, information from spurious sources that, again, as you said, 
puts opinion over fact and puts a spin on things um, because people are looking for a lens through which they can understand uh, what's going on nationally through that local lens. Um, and that's why we've seen the proliferation of these fake local news sites or kind of shoddy local news sites um, created by bad actors, both domestic bad actors. And again, the Kremlin has done this on a few occasions, not only here, but in Ukraine and several other countries. So I think that's part of it. Part of it is also just um, a lack of media literacy skills. And this is where kids actually are much better than older adults, at least here in the United States. Um, there's been a lot of polling that Many people who are over a certain age, I would say even over 40 to some degree, even though, you know, people of, of my generation and, and the generation ahead of me, Gen X, I suppose, grew up to some extent with the internet. Um, they're used to still having a media gatekeeper, someone that's doing content curation for them and saying, you know, these are the important stories, these are the trusted sources. And so when they encounter this information online, rather than coming through mainstream media like uh, a newspaper or the TV, they treat it with the same degree of veracity um, because it, they, we've not yet recalibrated our uh, reactions to, to kind of filtering information when it's coming from an online source. And this is especially true of elderly people in the United States who for their entire lives had uh, someone doing that curation for them, whether it was, you know, our, our nightly news, the radio or the newspaper. Um, and we really need to change those reflexes the same way, you know, to use a trope, we, we see e emails from a Nigerian prince offering us a million dollars and we know not to trust those. We need to have the same reflexes for information that we encounter online. And we need to kind of teach people how to vet that information because as it is they're just um, on one end of a fire hose of, of a ton of different information some of it true some of it opinion some of it completely fabricated and people don't yet have the skills to to navigate that situation and um, I do explain in the in the book uh, how a variety of different media literacy initiatives in these Central and Eastern European countries went. And generally, it's a very positive response. So it's something that I feel um, our countries need to invest a lot more in, and not just at the education uh, for, for children level, not just in sec secondary schools and universities, but also for adults. We need to find ways to reach them as well. And I have some ideas about that, but I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I think, Irina, um... Yeah, the question about cooperation with NATO. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, uh, as you know, NATO uh, uh, has a, uh, a, a very active uh, and very sophisticated STRATCOM unit, uh, and cooperation between the EU and NATO on STRATCOM issues uh, has already been going on for several years. Of course, we are trying to intensify that. Uh, and... Um, I think the, uh, our, our project right now is how do we integrate the rapid alert system that the EU has built, I've, I've just talked about, uh, how do we integrate that with uh, the NATO capacities and the G7 uh, capacities, uh, which are also not, not negligible. Uh, so how do, we, how do we pool resources, progress, uh, uh, and uh, how do we how do we step this up? And of course, we also cooperate bilaterally as Germany with Estonia uh, on on those issues. Thank you. So as um, I will say, we're um, bundling some questions. We have a question from uh, Martin Sebastian Abel. Martin, Hi everyone. First of all, thanks Aspen for doing this. Uh, I'm part of the NextGen network and um, I'm glad to have the opportunity and my question uh, regards platform providers like Facebook or Twitter. How do you rate uh, the program of these platforms um, on banning disinformation and fake news and do you share the, yeah, um, do you share that the content such as you did it, uh, nudity or pornography is deleted, blocked it very efficiently by those networks, but uh, hateful content, disinformation uh, takes some time or is not banned at all. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, and then we're adding a question, written question from uh, Laura, who's asking, um, I think it's uh, especially a question for Nina. Um, how is Russian disinformation influencing the upcoming US presidential election? 
Um, and also uh, probably um, a question following up on, on what Nina said earlier and was, but also um, Irene uh, was mentioning uh, from Duncan. Um, as um, Ms. Planck mentioned, the need for a better resilience against disinformation for the younger generation. As a member of the younger generation, I'm more worried about the lack of new media competency with all the generations. Is there any idea or program specific, uh, specifically targeting this issue? Probably also uh, specifically in Germany, I can, I can imagine would be an interesting question. <laughs> so yeah, Nina, you're up. Yeah, sure. So on the platform question, I mean, I think they've come a long way, but there's still a very long way to go. And the way that they conceive of the entire issue of disinformation um, is problematic. Uh, this is seen most recently in Facebook's decision to block new election ads one week before the election. Now, that might sound like a media blackout, like uh, many European countries have before the election. But what it actually means is that candidates can't buy new ads one week before the election, but they can create ads, let's say two weeks before the election and have them run throughout. Um, this, I mean, there's a lot of issues with this. I, I wrote a piece for Wired uh, a couple of weeks ago when they were considering a kill switch on ads where they could just say no more ads uh, in case something really bad was happening um, and it was coming from a domestic candidate, which, okay, at least they're recognizing that domestic, uh, you know, uh, disinformers exist. But what they're not recognizing is that the election is, is just an inflection point in a disinformation campaign. It is not the end point. We know that Russia, for instance, was still very much interfering in 2017 and 2018 and still today. Um, so thinking about it, just around elections is problematic. And also just thinking about it vis-a-vis -vis ads is prob problematic. Yes, I wish Facebook weren't taking money to promote lies, um, but we know a lot of the disinformation, especially now, as I outlined before, is, is spreading organically um, through things like groups. So Facebook especially leaves a lot to be desired. I think Twitter, personally, um, has really come around on this issue from where they were in 2016. And I think the types of, of interventions that we're seeing them do here in the United States, um, and if you haven't been following, I'll briefly overview, uh, they're often creating some friction um, with tweets that cr create or contain disinformation. So they'll cover it up and say, this contains false information about voting, and you have to click on it in order to uncover it. Um, that's for the most severe cases, but that's good because before people even interact with the information, it means that they've already got an understanding that it contains false information, but it's not taking it down because usually it's coming from uh, high level sources that would raise a fairly large stink if, <laughs> if they were to be censored as they would put it. Um, in other cases, Twitter is adding context. So um, for manipulated video or, uh, or images, it's adding a manipulated um, media kind of uh, subtitle. I wish that were bigger. I wish that you had to click into that, that it wouldn't just autoplay again. The more friction we can introduce and kind of change how people are consuming that content, I think is important. Um, and you brought up the question about nudity versus hate speech. So this is where it gets really difficult because a lot of how the platforms detect uh, pornography, nudity, or or even terrorist content is done through um, artificial intelligence. And what we've seen so far, although the tech executives will promise that AI is going to catch all disinformation someday, really these are inherently human problems. They're often expressed in slang. Um, you need some sort of context to understand whether they're disinformation or not. And even in the AI systems, uh, that they have deployed against disinformation narratives, or in the case of the whistleblower during impeachment, they did not catch everything. Um, and really what these companies need to invest in is more human reviewers who understand that context. And they, they've hired 30,000 people, so says Mark Zuckerberg over and over. But the problem with that is that's just a, a US investment that's in, and they're not even Facebook employees. Uh, <laughs> in many cases, they are contractors um, who aren't being paid enough and are working in very difficult conditions. Um, and that's in the US. What about all the countries like Ukraine, where they would need both Ukrainian and Russian and maybe some, some Hungarian speakers as well? What about all the countries that have um, many, many languages and dialects and, uh, and slang? We know here in the United States that African American um, slang is often censored by the AI because it doesn't view it as, as normal English. So there's these endemic problems um, with how AI works. And that's why the, the problem is so difficult for things related to speech versus things that are just images. 
very quickly on Russian disinformation impact on the 2020 election. It's going to be very difficult to say what the impact is uh, until we know what's happening. And unfortunately, there has been a blockage um, between the U.S. government expressing what's going on to the public, and that's because of the politicization of this issue. Also, because Russia is now relying so much on information laundering, again, it's very difficult to detect uh, what's going on as it's happening. It was already very difficult before, because in many cases, we don't have access to the back end of the platforms. Like with Facebook, we have to rely on what they're doing. But so far, what we've seen from the kind of sloppy um, operations that have been uncovered, there isn't much engagement on this stuff. And the things that worry me more are, you know, um, a Russian disinformer perhaps having some information that they give to someone in Ukraine who gives it to Rudy Giuliani, who then leaks it to the press or makes a big kind of press event out of it. Uh, and in fact, we should see this week the um, outcome of an investigation into Hunter Biden's dealings in Ukraine that has been conducted by some Republicans on Capitol Hill, uh, probably that led that emanated from information from someone who has now been designated on our uh, sanctions list because he is uh, almost certainly a Russian intelligence officer. So that's how disinformation is looking in 2020. Uh, what the impact will be uh, will probably take several months to assess and we're still assessing the impact from 2016. So um, to be determined, check back later. That's what the magic eight ball says. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for, for, for this, uh, Nina. And uh, Irene, so I, I can just... Yeah, um... yeah the question on, on media literacy uh, for the older generation. Uh, actually, that's something I've never thought about, but it's very interesting. Although on a personal level, of course, uh, I think uh, most people uh, of my generation just uh, struggle to keep up with the sheer technical developments uh, in the social media. Uh, I have never had a Twitter account until uh, three months ago. Uh, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, and um, uh, I think the existence of a platform named Telegram was uh, uh, totally unknown to me until a couple of months ago. So there's a good reason to ask that question. Um, but uh, I think what we need to realize is, and that's not so much a question of whether you use these media or have grown up with them or they're totally natural to you or they will remain a mystery till the day you die. I think what we need to become aware of and discuss is what impact does it all have? So it's a very interesting approach and as I said, I, I haven't yet thought about that, but uh, actually having some programs to, to make people who are not digital natives aware of what's even happening there, to, to allow them to not only to be aware, but also to take an adequate action. That's actually a very interesting idea. Thank you. I'll just, I'll add a little bit on that because there are some interesting models coming from Central and Eastern Europe that I think are worth entertaining. So um, in the Czech Republic, there was a program that used what I like to call the peas and the mashed potatoes approach, um, where uh, <laughs> basically taking uh, grandparents who perhaps need a little bit of help learning how to use like an iPad or tablet um, and showing them basic uh, skills, you know, how to FaceTime your grandchildren, basically. But in that computer literacy program are also oh. some kind of tips about uh, disinformation and fake news. So that's, that's one approach. Um, in Ukraine and increasingly here in the United States, uh, there have been media literacy programs that have been done during or at public libraries um, and libraries here in the States are still a very highly trusted institution, um, way outpacing any government institution or even state institutions. Um, and they're trusted as neutral arbiters of information. So holding classes at, at libraries that are free for people who, who want to attend um, is a great vector. Of course, we can't do it in person these days, um, but uh, that would be a great um, a way to, to reach those people, but also um, 
it's it, libraries are still to some extent looking for their new raison d'etre in the 21st century. Um, and this is one way that they could certainly invigorate the, the information sphere. So those are two things that I think about very frequently um, in terms of means of delivery. There's, uh, there's one point uh, I would add to this. Um, or a question probably, uh, which is important for, um, or interesting for the older generations, because what we see is um, uh, that traditional media has lost uh, its trust a bit. Uh, um, society uh, has lost its trust in traditional media. So how to restore this trust and, and, and what role can traditional news outlets have as independent validators, um, even in this very technical and, and um, and fast changing um, environment in 2020. So as someone who wears kind of a part-time journalist hat, I think one of the most important things that I've encountered is that people don't really understand how journalism works. They don't understand the process of how articles get commissioned and researched and fact-checked most of the time and any organization that calls itself a news organization should be doing fact checking, right? They don't understand how a title gets put on it, how the author has no control over that, of, of where it runs, all of this sort of stuff. Um, but the more that we can pull back the curtain on the operations of news organizations, I think there's less room for kind of all of these galaxy brain conspiracy theories about how they're a part of the deep state, right? <laughs> Um, and I think that's really important and should be part of, of media literacy education, but it's also important for news organizations to do. And so, um, especially in the age of, of video and digital media, um, I think that's why things like podcasts and these kind of video explainers about certain uh, topics have become so popular because people are really interested in understanding how that works. Now, if you don't have that trust initially, I mean, let, a Trump voter probably, for example, is not going to trust something like that that comes out of the New York Times, but uh, it could could gradually um, increase trust uh, over a wider spectrum of, of society. And I think that's something that more media organizations need to invest in. Do you want to, do you have something to add, Irena? Mm. Uh, actually, the, the poll you conducted half an hour ago comes to mind, where actually uh, traditional media uh, were not named as sources of disinformation, uh, which might also indicate that the information they provide is regarded, at least by, by people who are gathered here, uh, as reliable. And uh, then, uh, here again, I'm not a sociologist either, uh, but from, if I look at, at the German landscape, it seems to me that people have started to distrust uh, traditional media and turn to their social medium of preference. Um, that goes hand in hand, not so much uh, with, with, that goes um, hand in hand with a general sense uh, that they are being excluded uh, from society's mainstream. So uh, I think that might be a little bit more complex than that. But then again, I, that's just my personal impression and I can't put that on any study that uh, we would have commissioned. Sorry, but your, your own poll seems to indicate that this is not true. Right. <laughs> and last question um, from uh, Tyson. Hey, uh, sure. Actually, it's great that I can jump in on this because I think that the, the results of that poll are really a function of the self-selection of the group participating in this exercise uh, rather than uh, any kind of broader uh, statement on how people feel about, for example, broadcast or print media. In fact, in Germany, uh, there have been polls conducted of the German public that say around 20% of the German population say that the phrase Lügenpresse, a very loaded and difficult term, uh, which essentially means fake news, has something to it when referring to the mainstream press. And that's actually kind of a perfect lead into my question. Um, when you look at Germany, and Nina mentioned, oh, look at the newspapers, the local print media landscape is so amazing in Germany. In fact, here in Berlin, I think we have something like six newspapers or five daily print newspapers. It's nuts. That's something you wouldn't expect in the United States. Um, but you also see a slower adoption, a slower uptake in uses of new media, as which we have just described 
tend, can be vectors uh, for spreading disinformation among older populations. And sometimes that's reflected in political activism in Germany itself. And a great example I'll give is uh, voting rates among for the AFD, the Alternative for Germany in East Germany. The only thing that really kept the AFD from having dominance in two states, uh, Saxony and, and Brandenburg, was not the young people, it was the old people, because the old people were the ones who voted for the mainstream parties in a majority. The young people in those states voted overwhelmingly for the AFD. So my question is, and we're seeing something almost the opposite when we think of the demography uh, most primed to uh, uh, absorb disinformation in the United States. At least that's kind of the anecdotal impression that we have. So my question for Nina is, is, are you seeing the same thing more broadly in Europe and specifically in Central and Eastern Europe? Is it young people that are most vulnerable to disinformation campaigns? Um, and then I'll throw another question just for fun in. Um, Irena mentioned the European Action, Democracy Action Plan, which the European Union is preparing for the end of the year under the auspices of the German presidency. If you were an advisor uh, to uh, the European Commission, what are some items that you would like to see in that action plan? Whew, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> okay, final, are, young people, <laughs> yeah, are young people more vulnerable? I think it really depends on the country. Um, it's funny because in, for instance, the Ukrainian uh, landscape, um, disinformation landscape just looks entirely different compared to, to other Central and Eastern European countries because all of the mainstream media in Ukraine are owned by oligarchs, there's no state media, um, there's actually fairly high digital penetration among generations, so it really, I think it really depends. Um, and depends very, uh, very much on the, on the local media landscape, which I think um, connects to your, what your point was about AFD and, uh, and adoption by older populations of, of social media. Um, and I wrote an article uh, a couple of years, well, I guess just last year, although it seems like a very long time ago now, about um, social media penetration in, in Ukraine and how people basically rely on Facebook for everything. Um, I've had instances where I send an SMS and I will get, uh, or an email, and I'll get a Facebook message or a WhatsApp back because those are subsidized by the telecom platforms. Um, in, in Ukraine, uh, because so many people use them if they didn't subsidize access to the main social networks. Um, people's data packages would be absolutely unaffordable and they wouldn't make any money. So instead they, they make access to Facebook and Facebook products and Twitter, all these things free, um, which is a problem in and of itself and means that a lot more disinformation can proliferate through things like closed WhatsApp groups and Telegram channels, etc. Um, so question, I, I recognize that's not a direct answer to your question, Tyson, but I think it's, it depends. Um, what would I advise the European Commission? <sighs> uh, this is a really difficult one that I could probably write an entire paper on, um, but I think there, there needs to be uh, more, and, and we're getting toward this, but in instances of democratic backsliding, and I know this is very much, it seems out of, out of left field, but in instances of democratic backsliding, there need to be consequences. And the more those democratic vulnerabilities exist, the more there is a vulnerability toward disinformation. Um, and that has to be related to state-run state media as well. We've seen, of course, some very disturbing and notable takeovers and, and influence over uh, the public broadcasters in Poland and Hungary, I'm, I'm thinking of in particular. Um, and I think those instances are directly related to the proliferation of, of disinformation, both foreign and domestic. So I guess if I had to choose one thing, that would be what I, I would uh, put an emphasis on. And now you have the final words, Irena. Um, Nina's advice is well noted. <laughs> Uh, and I uh, thought this came to my mind because of that AFD uh, example that you that you quoted Tyson uh, about those elderly voters who were not so much into social media, uh, kind of staying in the mainstream and and not going to 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 those uh, proto-fascist uh, uh, parties. Um, another example which 
totally different, totally different. Uh, but where you also have this difference between age groups is Brexit, I think. Most young people voted for Brexit and presumably people who had more access to social media than those who voted, uh, sorry, voted against Brexit than the older ones who voted for Brexit. So might might be interesting to compare that. Sorry, that's a little bit unrelated, but it just came to mind. Yes, I mean, I think it's a good it's a good end, um, anyways, to to end with the question because this topic is so dynamic and and we could I think continue um, for another hour. So uh, thank you so much to both of you and to all the participants for this great discussion. I think we we learned a lot and um, a lot of questions. Not only the last one, but a lot of questions were raised and. There are no, um, no easy answers um, regarding um, uh, platform regulation, um, the, the, the current uh, disinformation topography. And I think we could probably uh, meet again in almost a year and then um, the, the environment would be completely different. So um, I, uh, I think we're all looking forward to uh, what's coming in the next uh, few, few days. Um, before and, and around the presidential elections and, and then of course uh, during next year's Bundestagswahl. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, thank you very much and um, I hope to see you soon again. Thank, thank you very much. That's been most interesting. Thank you.